Hey everyone, welcome back to our channel. I am your host Max and you are on the WECN channel. If you're new here, make sure to hit that subscribe button and ring the bell so you don't miss any of our deep dives into the world of blockchain and cryptocurrency. Today we're kicking off an exciting journey into the heart of blockchain technology with a focus on public key cryptography and one-way functions. These are the building blocks that make cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin secure, reliable and revolutionary. So grab a notebook, get comfortable and let's dive into the fascinating world of cryptography, the crypto in cryptocurrency. Cryptography is all about securing communication and data. It's about making sure that only the intended recipient can understand the message, even if someone else intercepts it. In the context of blockchain, cryptography ensures that transactions are secure, identities are verified, and data remains tamper-proof. Without cryptography, there would be no cryptocurrency. It's that fundamental. Today, we're going to explore two key concepts, public key cryptography, which powers secure communication and authentication and one-way functions, which are critical for things like mining and hashing in blockchain systems. By the end of this video, you'll have a solid understanding of how these concepts work together to make blockchain technology so powerful. Let's start with what cryptography is and why it matters for blockchain. At its core, cryptography is like a secret code for communication. Imagine you're sending a letter to a friend, but you don't want anyone else to read it. Cryptography gives you a way to scramble that letter so that only your friend can unscramble and read it. In the world of blockchain, this is crucial because transactions and data are constantly being sent across public networks where anyone could potentially snoop. To make this fun, let's meet our cast of characters who are the standard players in cryptography discussions. We've got Alice and Bob who want to talk securely. Then there's Eve, the sneaky eavesdropper trying to listen in. Sometimes we'll also meet Mallory, who's not just listening but actively trying to mess things up. And maybe Charlie or Carol as neutral third parties. These names are a tradition in cryptography, so you'll see them pop up a lot. So how does Alice send a message to Bob without Eve understanding it? That's where encryption comes in. Encryption is the oldest and most well-known use of cryptography, and it's all about transforming a readable message called plain text into something unreadable called ciphertext. Only someone with the right key can turn that ciphertext back into plain text. Let's start with the simplest form of encryption, symmetric key encryption. In this system, Alice and Bob both use the same key to encrypt and decrypt messages. Think of it like a shared secret password they both know. Alice takes her message, let's call it M, and uses an encryption function. Let's call it E, along with the shared key, KE, to create the ciphertext, C. She sends this ciphertext to Bob, who uses the same key, KE, and the decryption function, D, to turn it back into the original message, M. Here's a quick example to make it clear. Let's say Alice's message is, meet me at noon. She uses the encryption function and the key to scramble it into something like xjhhlfkdpsw. Eve snooping on the network sees only this gibberish. Without the key, she's out of luck. Bob, however, knows the key so he can decrypt it and read meet me at noon. Now let's dive into a classic example of symmetric key encryption, the Caesar cipher. This is one of the oldest encryption methods dating back thousands of years to Julius Caesar himself. It's super simple but helps illustrate how encryption works. The Caesar cipher works by shifting every letter in the alphabet by a fixed number of positions, determined by the key. First, we assign numbers to the letters of the alphabet. A is 1, B is 2, C is 3, and so on, up to Z as 26. The key, KI, is a number that tells us how much to shift each letter. For example, if the key is 5, we add 5 to each letter's number to get the encrypted letter. Let's try an example. Suppose Alice wants to send the message attack at dawn to Bob, and their key is 5. Here's how it works. The first letter, A, is 1, add a 5, and you get 6, which is F. The second letter, T, is 20, add a 5, and you get 25, which is Y. The third letter, T, is 20 again, so we get 25, which is Y. And so on for each letter. When we're done, the message attack at dawn becomes the cipher text FYYFHPFYIFS. To anyone like Eve, who doesn't know the key, this looks like nonsense. But Bob, who knows the key is 5, can decrypt it by subtracting 5 from each letter's number. For example, F is 6, subtract 5, and you get 1, which is A. Do this for every letter, and Bob gets back, attack at dawn. If you're curious to try this yourself, you can use a simple script to automate it. For example, in Ruby, you could write a small program to shift letters forward for encryption and backward for decryption. The beauty of the Caesar cipher is its simplicity, but that's also its biggest weakness. The Caesar cipher is a great teaching tool, but it's not secure by modern standards. Why? because it's vulnerable to several types of attacks. First, there's frequency analysis. In English, some letters are used more often than others. For example, E is the most common letter, followed by T, A, and so on. If Eve gets her hands on a long piece of ciphertext, 
she can count which letters appear most often and make educated guesses about what they correspond to in the plain text. For instance, if Y is the most common letter in the ciphertext, it's likely the encrypted version of E. By mapping the most frequent letters, Eve can start to crack the code without even knowing the key. Second, there's the known plaintext attack. If Eve knows both the plaintext and the ciphertext for even a small part of the message, like if she knows attack at dawn becomes phi y fp fy ifs, she can figure out the key. Since she knows the algorithm, add the key to each letter's number, she can compare the plaintext and ciphertext, see that a, 1, became f, 6, and deduce that the key is 5. Finally, there's the brute force attack. The Ziza cipher only has 26 possible keys, one for each letter of the alphabet, though a key of 0 or multiples of 26 would leave the text unchanged, so really 25. Eve could simply try every possible key, shift by 1, shift by 2 and so on, until she finds one that produces readable text. With only 25 possibilities, this is trivially easy, especially with a computer. These weaknesses highlight an important principle in cryptography, known as Kirchhoff's principle. It says that a cryptographic system should remain secure even if the attacker knows the algorithm. The security should depend entirely on the secrecy of the key, not on keeping the algorithm a secret. Hiding the algorithm, relying on security through obscurity, is a bad idea because algorithms can be reverse engineered or leaked. The Caesar cipher fails this test spectacularly, which is why we don't use it in modern systems. Encryption is great for keeping messages private, but cryptography isn't just about secrecy, it's also about authentication. In the blockchain world, authentication is critical because it lets us verify that a message or transaction came from the person it claims to be from. Let's say Alice sends Bob a message, but Eve has gotten sneakier. She's not just eavesdropping, she's intercepting and modifying messages or even sending fake ones pretending to be Alice. How can Bob be sure the message is really from Alice? This is where authentication comes in. Let's say Alice and Bob share a secret authentication key, KA. Alice can use this key to create a special code called an authentication tag and attach it to her message. When Bob receives the message, he uses the same key to check the tag. If it matches, he knows the message is from Alice. If Eve tries to forge a message, she won't know the authentication key, so her fake tag won't match, and Bob will know something's up. For example, imagine Alice and Bob have a secret code word, like seagull. When Alice sends a message, she includes seagull to prove it's her. In cryptography, the authentication tag is like a mathematical version of that code word, generated using the authentication key and a special function. This ensures Bob can trust the message's source. We can combine encryption and authentication for even more security. Alice encrypts her message with the encryption key to keep it private, then adds an authentication tag using the authentication key to prove it's from her. When Bob receives it, he first checks the authentication tag to confirm it's from Alice, then decrypts it to read the message. This way, the message is both private and verified. Symmetric key encryption is simple and fast, but it has a big problem. How do Alice and Bob share their secret key in the first place? They need a secure channel to exchange KE and KEA, like meeting in person or using a trusted courier. But if they have a secure channel, why not just send the message that way? In the real world, especially on the internet or in blockchain networks, you often don't have a secure channel, especially if you're communicating with someone you've never met. For example, if you're sending Bitcoin to a wallet address you found online, you don't have a way to meet the recipient in person to exchange keys. This is a huge limitation for symmetric key encryption in large-scale systems like blockchain where participants are often anonymous or geographically distant. This problem led to the development of a game-changing innovation, asymmetric key encryption, also known as public key cryptography. Public key cryptography, introduced in the 1970s by pioneers like Diffie and Hellman, revolutionized how we secure communication. Unlike symmetric key encryption, which uses one shared key, public key cryptography uses two keys, a public key and a private key. These keys are mathematically related but work very differently. Here's how it works. Bob generates a pair of keys, a public key, PBOB, which he shares with the world, and a private key, SBOB, which he keeps secret. Anyone can use Bob's public key to encrypt a message for him, but only Bob, with his private key, can decrypt it. This means Alice can send Bob a secure message without ever needing a secure channel to share keys beforehand. Let's walk through it. Alice wants to send Bob a message. Meet me at noon. She finds Bob's public key. Maybe he posted it on his website or a blockchain. She uses it to encrypt her message into ciphertext, which might look like a random string of characters. She sends this ciphertext over the internet, where Eve can see it but can't understand it. When Bob receives it, he uses his private key to decrypt it back into Meet Me at Noon. Simple, secure, and no secret key exchange required. If Bob wants to reply, he does the same thing in reverse. He finds Alice's public key, encrypts his response with it, and sends it. Only Alice, with her private key, can decrypt it. Throughout this process, Eve sees only ciphertext and public keys, which are useless without the private keys. 
This system is incredibly powerful for blockchain. If you've ever used Bitcoin or another cryptocurrency, you've seen this in action. Your wallet's public address is like a public key. Anyone can send funds to it, but only you with your private key can access those funds. That's why the saying, not your keys, not your coins is so important. If you don't control the private key, you don't truly own the assets. Let's connect this to blockchain directly. In Bitcoin, for example, public key cryptography is used to secure transactions. When you send Bitcoin, you're using your private key to sign the transaction, proving it's really you. The network verifies this using your public key, ensuring the transaction is legitimate without revealing your private key. This is how blockchain maintains trust in a decentralized system. No central authority needed, just cryptography. The specific method Bitcoin uses is called Elliptic Curve Digital Signature Algorithm, ICDSA. It's a type of public key cryptography that's efficient and secure. The math behind ECDSA involves complex elliptic curve mathematics, but the key idea is that it generates a public-private key pair that's mathematically linked. You publish the public key, keep the private key secret, and the system works like magic. One thing to note, public key cryptography isn't perfect. It's slower than symmetric key encryption because the math is more complex. In practice, many systems, including some blockchain protocols, use a hybrid approach. They start with public key cryptography to establish a secure channel, then exchange a symmetric key for faster communication. For example, when you visit a secure website, like one with HTTPS, your browser uses public key cryptography to set up a session, then switches to symmetric encryption for speed. Public key cryptography solves the key sharing problem, but it introduces a new challenge. How do you know a public key actually belongs to the person it claims to represent? For example, how does Alice know that PBob is really Bob's public key and not Eve pretending to be Bob? This is where public key infrastructure, PKI, comes in. In traditional internet systems, PKI relies on certificate authorities, CAs. These are trusted organizations that verify identities and issue digital certificates linking a public key to a specific entity like Amazon.com. Your web browser checks these certificates to ensure you're on the real website. If you've ever seen a certificate error warning, that's your browser saying it can't verify the site's identity. Another approach is the web of trust. Instead of a central authority, you rely on a network of trusted individuals. For example, if you trust Bob and Bob trusts Alice, you might trust Alice's public key because Bob vouches for her. This works well in small communities but gets messy at scale. How do you trust someone five degrees removed? In blockchain, most cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin don't use a formal PKI. Instead, they rely on the principle of possession is ownership. If you have the private key for a Bitcoin address, you control the funds. There's no central authority saying this address belongs to Bob. This decentralization is powerful, but also risky. If you lose your private key or someone steals it, there's no way to prove ownership. That's why securing your private key is critical. Now, let's shift gears to one-way functions, another cornerstone of blockchain technology. A one-way function is a mathematical operation that's easy to compute in one direction, but incredibly hard to reverse. Think of it like baking a cake. Mixing flour, eggs, and sugar is easy, but turning a baked cake back into its raw ingredients is nearly impossible. Here's a simple example. If I ask you to square a number, say 27, it's easy, 27 x 27 or 729. But if I give you 729 and ask for its square root, it's much harder. You might need to guess or use a calculator. This is a basic analogy for a one-way function. In cryptography, these functions are far more complex, designed to be computationally infeasible to reverse, meaning it would take an impractical amount of time or computing power. Why are one-way functions important for blockchain? They are the foundation of things like hashing and mining. For example, in Bitcoin mining, miners compete to solve a mathematical puzzle that involves a one-way function. It's easy to verify a solution, but extremely hard to find one, which is why mining requires so much computational effort. This ensures that creating new blocks is secure and tamper-proof. No function has been proven to be truly one-way in a mathematical sense, but cryptographers use functions that are so hard to reverse that they're effectively one-way for practical purposes. These functions are critical for proving that a computation has been done, like in mining, without revealing the underlying data. Let's bring it all together. Public key cryptography and one-way functions are the backbone of blockchain technology. Public key cryptography ensures that transactions are secure and verifiable, allowing users to prove ownership and send funds without a central authority. One-way functions make processes like mining and hashing secure, ensuring that the blockchain remains tamper-proof and trustworthy. In Bitcoin, for example, your wallet address is derived from your public key and your private key lets you sign transactions. The network uses one-way functions to verify those transactions and to secure the process of adding new blocks through mining. Together, these concepts create a system that's decentralized, secure, and resistant to attacks. We've covered a lot today, from the basics of symmetric key encryption to the power of public key cryptography and the magic of one-way functions. In our next video, we'll dive deeper into hashing, how it works, why it's critical for blockchain, and how it ties into mining and data integrity. 
If you thought this was fascinating, just wait until we unpack the world of cryptographic hashing. Before we wrap up, let's recap the key points. Cryptography is about securing communication and data, and it's the foundation of cryptocurrency. Symmetric key encryption uses a shared key, but requires a secure channel for key exchange. The Caesar cipher is a simple example of encryption, but is easily broken due to frequency analysis, known plain text attacks, and brute force attacks. Public key cryptography uses a public-private key pair, eliminating the need for a secure channel and powering blockchain transactions. One-way functions are easy to compute but hard to reverse, making them essential for blockchain security and mining. If you enjoyed this deep dive, give this video a thumbs up and share it with your friends who are curious about blockchain. Got questions? Drop them in the comments below and I'll do my best to answer them in our next Q&A. Don't forget to subscribe and hit the bell so you don't miss our next lecture on hashing and more blockchain fundamentals. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next one. Stay curious, stay secure and keep exploring the world of blockchain.